This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us today is Dr. Amy Steele and Professor John Wardle. John Wardle is Professor of Public Health and Director of the National Centre for Naturopathic Medicine at SCU, Southern Cross University in Lismore, New South Wales. He leads several World Federation of Public Health Association and World Health Organisation initiatives on integrative medicine. Dr. Amy Steele is Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Research Centre in Complementary and Integrative Medicine at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. As part of her research role, she also leads numerous research projects for the World Naturopathic Federation. Welcome both of you to FX Medicine. How are you going? Thanks, Andrew. Great to be here. Thanks for having us, Andrew. So today we're going to be talking about advocacy and lobbying and all that is entailed within it. But I think firstly, to start, some listeners may not be aware of a difference between lobbying and advocacy. So can we go through the difference and what they entail, please? Uh, Amy, can I ask you first? I think from my perspective, advocacy is about providing a voice to a group that doesn't necessarily have one. So usually it's about taking a voice that's disempowered in a certain setting and giving voice to that group. Um, making sure that everyone who needs to hear the voice of that group hears it. Uh, whereas lobbying is about targeting a particular uh, audience and trying to convince them of a certain um, opinion or perspective. So they're, they're absolutely enmeshed with one another, but advocacy is more general and is, is about generally just taking the, the uh, capturing the voice of, of a disempowered group and giving it to giving them a voice in general, whereas lobbying is much more targeted and has an outcome in, in mind as well. That's, that's my definition of that. I don't know if, if John's got a different version. Gotcha. John? Yeah, well, I guess what I'd add to that is advocacy is really about pushing the you know profession forward or, or whatever you're pushing forward and highlighting the role that is perhaps unfilled and you know, what the profession should be doing or what they can add to society, patients, um, other, other communities more generally. Um, lobbying is then actually taking that implementation and translation step. So, you know, you know what you should be doing. Lobbying is about trying to make that happen. So, um, you know, we, we, we like to think that, um, you know, evidence-based policy is, is, is a thing that actually happens, but, but politicians don't follow the evidence. It's more about politics than policy. So, um, you know, I guess the advocacy is really about good policy and the lobbying is about good politics. Okay, so to continue on from that, how did you first become involved in this? I'll, I'll continue with you, John. Uh, well, yeah, accidentally, um, I, I guess just by probably virtue of my, my nature, I'm a, I'm a territorian. I don't tend to um, hold back when I disagree or agree or, or want to push things forward. Um, and, you know, what I did find is that when you actually put cases forward to people, if they are rational cases, if they are cases that actually um, do make sense to, to someone, politicians are generally open to hear them. Um, you know, other, other members are generally open to hear them. Um, but, you know, what, what really needs to happen is it needs to be strategic. And that's the thing that really passion, you know, passionately got me into this profession was about helping patients. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, everyone wants patients to be better. Um, no one cares about the profession in, in politics or, or, or any other group. But if you can actually highlight the role of the profession as a vehicle to, to bring in better patient care, there's suddenly a lot of interest. And um, I guess it's just as I moved along more and more, there was um, a lot of the barriers that I thought were, you know, <laughs> or, or that I was taught were actually out there for naturopaths were actually quite fake barriers. They're the same barriers that every other profession has had to overcome. Um, the biggest barrier was actually naturopaths getting out there and actually arguing um, for a bigger role um, and actually putting the, you know, wearing out the shoe leather, as they call it. Right. In that lobbying space. And Amy, how did you first become involved? Um, I think I have a, a background role in, in lobbying in that I, I do some, you know, actual active lobbying, but most of the work I do is about collecting the data that we need and, under, and, the, and the evidence that, that is useful for those lobbying efforts. Um, so I guess I, I don't believe that I have... Um, the political now to kind of spend heaps and heaps of time down in Canberra sitting across ministers and navigating all of that. That's not that I can't do it, but it's not where my strength is. And so I spend a lot more of my time um, identifying what the evidence is that we need, identifying policy um, directions that the, that the health um, 
policymakers are taking it in us in, in Australia and elsewhere and figuring out what evidence we need to collect to show what role we might be able to play there. And so that's where I've sort of put most of my energy. Okay. So, John, you said something a little bit earlier. I'll, I'll continue on with that one. And, and you said to argue a case. But when does lobbying or advocacy actually turn into an argument? Like what, and, and what are the strategies, I guess, that we need to refrain from becoming emotionally um, charged? You know, mm. there's passion is one thing, but then you can be argumentative. So how do you go? I guess I'm referring here to when you're presenting mm. to politicians. Yeah, and, and you know that, that that's a really good example, Andrew, because I've, I've I've presented from you know uh, I, I've met with everyone from you know Bob Catter to Pauline Hanson to uh, you know Julia Gillard to Tanya Plibersek to, to Greg Hunt and, and and Scott Morrison. And look, I, I I definitely don't agree with everyone on that spectrum. It's such a wide spectrum. <laughs> so um, you know you have to be don't able tell to tell me they're on the what, spectrum. <laughs> well, politics is a spectrum, so and um, I'm I'm on that spectrum somewhere, and so is everyone else. And um, I, I won't tell people what party I I guess most align myself with, but um, quite often it's not the one that I often have to present an argument in front of. So, you know, when when you're talking about argument, everyone has a passion about something, and everyone disagrees with about you know other other issues. So it's really about focusing on that area of commonality. Um, you're going to disagree. That's just a part of human nature, and I guess acknowledging that it is okay to disagree on a number of things um, and focus on those areas of commonality where you actually do have a common voice that you can move forward. So, um, you know, Labor, for example, um, is very passionate about health, but it's also reasonably dispassionate about complementary medicine because it views it as middle-class medicine. Um, so, you know, the argument you've got to take there is actually treating the underserved and opening up those services. If you're looking at the Liberal Party, for example, you know, they're more about freedom of choice in your, your health care services and they don't necessarily um, believe in public health care as much. So, you know, you can sort of use that enhancing the private health care um, argument and actually expanding, you know, freedom of choice of practitioners. So um, the same argument's not going to work with everyone and you're not always going to have the same allies um, in the same lobbying or advocacy efforts you have. And, you know, I've, you know in, in a naturopathic perspective, I've had really positive relationships in advocacy with, with groups like ATMS that most people think that I hate um, because, I, you know, because they disagree with registration and degree um, minimum standards. And we do disagree very, very strongly on those things, but we have mutual interests where we've actually worked together quite, quite a lot. So um, I think it's about, you know, the profession knowing that it can disagree with other people uh, or other elements of the profession, but also knowing that that's okay. <laughs> and you can actually work with those people in the areas you do agree. Yeah. Um, Amy, I'm going to ask you, who, in your opinion, are doing the bulk of the lobbying and the advocacy work for our professions? Oh, well, I mean, John is absolutely doing the bulk of that work, um, but I'm sure he would also um, acknowledge that there's a raft of, of people who uh, are, are contributing as well. And I think the reason that he's doing the bulk of the work is because he was the first one in, in the room and he he's um, been... Um, paving the way in that regard, but he's also been taking a lot of energy to, to bringing other people along. So we're building up a lot of capacity within the profession for more people to be involved in that way, but he could probably speak more to what he's doing in that space. Okay, so John, continue. Um, yeah, there's actually quite a, a large group of people actually doing a lot of work in this space at the moment. So, you know, one, one professional association I think that is taking a lot of leadership um, in this space at the moment is the NHAA. Um, they've certainly started um, budgeting for advocacy, which I think is incredibly important um, for any professional organisation. If you if you can't pay for it, then <laughs> you can't do it. Mm. And um, you know, even even something like a Murray's bus to Canberra is forty dollars, and, and yeah. you don't have even something as simple as that. Um, it's very difficult. Um, look, there are a lot of um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you told me not to talk about industry, but I will. They they do a lot of stuff in the background, but I guess um, there's an overlapping of interests, but they don't have the full Venn diagram of interest. So there's a whole heap of professional issues that, frankly, no one but the profession actually cares about, and no one's got to push forward unless the profession does. So, um, you know, they've certainly got a very active role. And, you know, um, John O'Doherty at Blackmores, for example, their government relations person, has been very active in the private health insurance um, issues. Um, other companies were very, you know, they've got a very active interest in the traditional medicine stuff at TGA and that kind of stuff as well. So, um, 
but there are a lot of professional issues that I think are under um, underdeveloped because we kind of rely on other people to do it as a profession. And, and, and really, um, there's not a lot of people out there doing that. And there are a lot of people out there, I would say, that probably are doing it very ineffectively. So there's a lot of action, but not a lot of impact, if that makes sense. And um, I, I, I won't name names, but there is one very, there is one professional association who is always in Canberra, for example, well, two actually. Um, <clears throat> but they're always trying to argue um, you know, uh, the private health insurance legislation is a really good example. They were arguing about the impact on the profession, or this is going to decimate the profession. Um, and look, the government just doesn't care so, um, uh, about the profession. You, know, you need to put in an argument they do care about, which yeah. is patients, cost savings, um, something like that. And, and I remember actually meeting with the minister's advisor when they, um, you know, they gave a, this is going to cost the, um, you know, this is going to impact a, $4 billion profession, uh, uh, industry, if, if these changes go through, it's going to decimate our $4 billion industry. The government had done modelling. Uh, it had worked out that the, it, the profession would probably lose $200 million out of this change. And um, they actually thought quite positively about that. But $200 million out of a $4 billion industry doesn't sound too bad. Maybe we're on the right track. So the, the, the lobbying they're doing had completely the opposite effect. So you do have to be strategic and you do have to frame it in you know, not the profession. No one cares about the profession apart from the profession. So you have to frame it in some other way. And unless you do that, you're not going to get very far. Right. And can I, Amy, I can add to that, sorry, yes. is the, um, I think one of the more recent developments as well has been the Australian Naturopathic Council, which has formed. And it, it's a, it's a, you know, cl a collaboration, really, um, between the NHAA, Complementary Medicines Association, ARONA, um, and also the, the colleges who teach naturopathic degrees in Australia. Um, and where that's been really useful is, is one of the things that's been a, a challenge for the naturopathic profession in Australia in lobbying is that the few people with the skills and the exp expertise and experience to do that work have been separated out, involved in different organisations. What we've been able to do through the Naturopathic Council is consolidate a lot of that and share resources and energy and skills and expertise so, and put together, we've put more submissions together in the last probably two years for the naturopathic profession than any of those organizations have done individually just because we've been able to collaborate where and where appropriate and it's been such an effective way of consolidating the skills and the expertise that we have gotcha amy i'll follow on with you so what role do you think your past clinical experience plays in your research activities today how has it influenced them um, it's been very influential because I, I've worked in multiple clinical settings. I've worked in my own private clinic um, in, a, in a home environment, in a multimodality, um, natu like natural therapies clinic. I've worked in a rural setting as well as an urban setting. Okay. Um, I've also done other industry-related work. I've worked as a, as a product representative, so I went and visited a lot of naturopaths in clinics and spoke to them about the issues. And because my my focus of my research is less about do, does what we do work and more about what it, who are we and what can we offer. Um, having that really diverse exposure to different types of practice environments and practitioners has given me a lot of different insights and suits to the sort of challenges that the profession has faced and places where we can really strengthen ourselves. Um, and I've made that decision on purpose because and it is kind of with that lobbying hat on the, that if we don't have evidence that we even exist as a profession and that we can contribute something of value, then having evidence that we have clinical effect for a particular product or treatment or practice in a particular health condition in a particular population isn't going to help in the long run because we're going to just fall apart as a profession. So most of my research has been about identifying the diversity of our profession and making sure that we've got documentation that we that we exist and have something to valuable to contribute right and john yeah look i i think the um you know <laughs> when we talk about clinical education and practice i think we focus way too much on the therapies and the and the you know the the, the products that we might be using but the real value in what you learn as a naturopath is how to think about health problems and how to think about problems more generally you know, complexity is not a stranger to you. You're not scared of it. Um, you know, you can deal with complex moving parts and actually find the interactions to actually uncover, you know, what's really going on. And that doesn't leave you if you're in practice or in other settings. And 
Um, one of the reasons I really love public health is because public health actually lets you apply that naturopathic, you know, way of, of, of viewing things through, through another prism. Um, you know, I've, I've been at forums. Um, so, so, you know, uh, the National Centre for Naturopathic Medicine has just been invited onto the Australian Health Policy Consortium. And, and the reason that, that that has happened is because, um, you know, when I was working on a, a panel for the self-care agenda um, for the government run by the Mitchell Institute, they were really intrigued at, you know, these, innovative ways of or solutions that are you know were, were coming from uh from me which were very obvious to me as a naturopath but very very um strange to them as as um non-naturopaths i guess you know they, they would never have thought of thinking like that to actually find the underlying cause or you know to, to look at you know complex systems and how they might work with each other and you know trying to actually find a commonality that can actually help you know address the the issue that that sort of fell out of that so that, that never leaves you. And that's equally as applicable in a policy setting, a research setting, um, a public health setting, or, or a one-on-one -on -one, um, individual um, case presentation and clinic. Okay. So currently, what sort of research are you involved in? I'll, I'll go both. I'll go John first and then Amy again. But what sort of research are you involved in now? And what are you trying to achieve with that research? I'm, I'm, I'm picking up already a sort of flavour, which is really interesting because it it's a little bit at odds from what i have felt myself but i'm getting to understand why i think so continue john so the question is what's what sort of research are you currently involved in what do you hope to achieve from it yeah so look we <laughs> we have quite a few research streams so i'll try and think of a few that are, are kind of um i guess more narrowly focused. So, you know, we, we do have a big clinical research stream. And one of the things that I'm you know, particularly passionate about is actually looking at the stuff that naturopaths are doing that hasn't been tested yet. So, um, you know, so we, um, you know, have a number of programs looking at complex conditions. So we've got an integrative, you know, um, uh, health program for veterans that we're currently doing, because that's a group that actually isn't treated well by conventional medicine, but is actually treated quite well by, by, by naturopaths and other integrative health practitioners. Um, you know, we're looking at a lot of traditional treatments, you know, I'm very interested in things like hydrotherapy or that, um, you know, the, the, those self-care modalities that um, uh, I, I, I think are really undervalued by um, conventional healthcare, but I, I dare say probably undervalued by naturopaths themselves. So right. um, the, the other thing that we're really doing a lot of at the moment is, is sort of um, research on traditional knowledge and actually sort of capturing that in a little bit more of a complex way. Um, and look, you know, we, we had one student, for example, who did, did, did work on adaptogens. And it was incredible because everyone um, knew what an adaptogen was. Everyone was very consistent on where, <laughs> um, on, on how they would define them, but, but no one could actually tell us where that came from. So, um, you know, there was a complete disagreement on, you know, oh, it's a Russian thing. Oh, no, it's a Chinese thing. Oh, so, you know, but there was nothing from Western herbal medicine, even though it is actually a traditional Western herbal medicine concept. So... You know, trying to find back from, I guess, that innate, I guess, you know, wisdom of indigenous or traditional or, or, or um, previously untapped forms of knowledge um, is, is, is a very big part of what we do. And we run the gamut of everything from, you know, ethnobotanical um, surveys and work in that space. Um, you know, we sent a student to, to Russia um, last year to sort of, you know, see if there was secret Soviet research in herbal medicines, which there is a lot of, yeah. um, which was quite interesting. Um, and, you know, going back to those old texts to, to find really interesting research. So we're working with, a, um, you know, with a, with a, a naturopathic college in Phoenix um, at the moment on, on antiviral medications and the way that we found one that might potentially work in, um, they've actually tested in Ebola in vitro. Uh, and it, it does seem to have some real, um, well, but in vitro doesn't necessarily go to <laughs> in vivo. I know. I know. Um, but... Uh, but, you know, the, the way they found it was from one case study in a book from the 1850s. So, you know, so, you know, we've got a, we've got a program um, that was done at SU, which is trying to look at the use of Australian indigenous plants um, in the first 50 years of colonization by settlers, the Chinese medicine community, because there was a lot of Chinese medicine use of Australian indigenous plants and the indigenous community itself. Because there's, there's so much work that's, um, you know, a lot of people talk about tradition, but really there's, there's surprisingly little scholarly uh, research or attention on, on, on traditional knowledge in naturopathy. Uh, and I think that's just a real tragedy. Right. And Amy? Well, um, my 
I guess similar similar to John, once you once you finish your PhD and become kind of well and truly in, on the road of, of in in being a researcher, you end up with multiple streams. Um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll I'll pick a few that that give a bit of an example of the flavour. But I, I'm obviously a lot of work I do is is generally around the naturopathic profession, as I mentioned before. Um, and for me, it's really about a lot of that focus or impetus for that has been identifying areas where I feel like the health system is looking for answers and I believe we already have the answers. We've just never documented those answers. Right. Um, and so I've got a research student who's just now finishing her PhD. Her whole, whole, whole she did her honours and a PhD on the role of, of naturopathy amongst other professions in patient-centred care. That actually came from when I very first started um, after I finished my PhD, um, I wrote a submission on behalf of the NHAA to um, the government about the role that of, it was a submission that they put out for, for primary care and how we're going to provide, uh, address patient-centred care and chronic disease management. And so my submission was the fact that naturopaths actually have a role to play here. But I realised that despite the fact that we position ourselves in our pr principles and philosophies as having a strong patient-centred care approach, we didn't have any evidence of that. And so she's now built up this lovely body of work that confirms that we actually, from the patient's experience, we do provide patient-centered care. And we actually provide a higher level of patient-centered care than almost any other health profession providing care to people with chronic disease. So that's a really important argument for us to make to health policymakers when they're saying, how are we going to sort fix this issue in the health system? We can put our hands up and say, well, we're, we're a big part of that solution for you. So there's that body of work. I'm also, I've always been very interested, in fact, my master's research that I did before I even did my PhD was around the use of evidence and information and practice. And it's in response to the argument or the, the, the call for evidence-based practice. But my view is that we haven't, as a profession, given enough scope and emphasis and, and priority to our traditional knowledge. We haven't treated it with the same respect in the sense that we don't have a good sense of what it is. What is the body of knowledge that it's traditional naturopathic knowledge? And do we try to train our, our, our professional graduates in how to engage with it, make sense of something that was written 500 years ago and used today and, tr and translating that knowledge across? We don't actually think about how to do that in a really meaningful way. And in doing that, we actually belittle the knowledge by doing that. We, we teach um, graduate students how to critically evaluate research papers but not how to critically evaluate traditional knowledge. And that means that we're treating it very superficially and not giving it the respect that it deserves. And so that's a big part of what it is that I'm, I'm also a big part of what I'm trying to do. So there's a survey at the moment that I'm preparing for the World Naturopathic Federation and they needed some evidence to show how much we were using research in practice. And um, I, I, my response to that was actually, I think that that's not the question we need to be asking because evidence-based practice isn't more than just about research evidence. It's also about clinician experience. It's about patient experience. There's the traditional knowledge aspect of that. And so instead we've built this, this survey that engages with the idea of, of all of these different types of knowledge and information having value and potentially being used and helping to understand in what circumstances they're being used and exactly how they're valued by a naturopathic practitioner. So it, it de-emphasizes the expectation that every piece of valuable knowledge ever is going to come from a research paper and allows for the fact that these other types of knowledge also have value. So beyond that, probably I won't go into the details, but I have a whole stream of work that I do on women's health as well, um, which, which mm -hmm. allows me to advocate quietly for naturopathy in a bigger kind of Trojan horse of women's health, preconception care, pregnancy, that kind of stuff. I'd just like to add to what Amy says, because I think this is a really important point a lot of people in the profession probably don't um, fully understand or, 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 or recognize, but um, the, the naturopathic philosophy and traditions are actually very important from, um, from a public health, from a legal, from a legislative and from an implementation perspective. So I, I remember when we first went to the WHO as a, the World Naturopathic Federation, it took a lot of convincing that we were naturopathic medicine and not just natural medicine. And I think there's a lot of confusion over what makes a naturopath naturopathic mm -hmm. beyond just the fact that we use natural medicine products. And, you know, it's that core sort of under uh, underlying philosoph philosophical and principles-based uh, system of treatment that actually is the real valuable thing. And um, it, it breaks my heart a little bit, to be honest, when I do see on, on some of the forums, um, you know, the professions com conflating natural medicine and naturopathic medicine. They are very, very different concepts. And look, w without naturopathic philosophy, um, 
you're you're, you're just a, a a a profession who you know if 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 you if you don't have the naturopathic philosophy, we may as well give the whole natural medicine movement to, to integrative medical doctors because they're already got access to medical rebates. They've already got um. Uh, you know, access to patients. And to be honest, if they're not applying naturopathic philosophy, they're just doing natural medicine. Um, there's no real benefit over over them uh, versus the naturopathic profession. So, you know, this this sort of uh, critical uh, examination of the what, what being a naturopath actually means is incredibly important at a global and a national level. Okay. Just moving on from there to the relevance though. And, and I guess I'm slowly changing my viewpoint. Like I've been in the past of the mind that, you know, enough to do with sociology and enough to do with, um, you know, what, what we think we fit in as and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And can we please have more clinical stuff? You know, does curcumin work for X amount of conditions and, and more that sort of thing? So where does each side fit? And I guess where is the relevance of doing your sort of research? Like, is it clinically relevant? Hmm. Um, look, go on, I, I'll continue with you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> look, look I, I, I think it is incredibly relevant. So, um, you know, when, when I was at the University of Washington in, in 2010, because I was a, a neutral naturopath, I guess, I, I got invited onto a state committee. And I, I, I remember something that the, um, you know, the committee chair actually said there. And they said, you know, we're, we're tired of naturopaths coming up and telling us they're the same, you know, trained the same as medical doctors. They've got this degree, they've got this degree. We know, you know, you're already at the table, but what can you actually do? And I, I think, you know, the importance of public health research is, is exactly that, showing what naturopaths can do and why it should be a naturopath um, delivering nutritional information rather than a dietitian or a, or, or a GP or, or, or some other um, professional group. So, um, you know, when, when Stephen Myers did his, um, his critical review of, of, of naturopathic studies last year, one of the criticisms was, you know, uh, John Dwyer said, well, you know, um, you know, this isn't naturopathic medicine. This is a, uh, um, you know, this is saying that people, you know, with lifestyle education and better diet and, um, you know, all these other practices get better. You know, no, no brainer. There, of course, it does. And I think the, um, you know, and so his suggestion was, you know, we'll just get more dietitians and more physiotherapists and more conventional practitioners in these spaces. So, it's important to show why the naturopaths themselves are important in this space because we're answering not just clinical questions, but political questions and policy questions and funding questions. And um, having all the clinical evidence in the world doesn't actually change politicians' minds. If they, if they actually see a advantage or a group that's being not served well by current needs or something like that, there, there are all sorts of other social, political and, and cultural considerations that go into building the healthcare system. I see your point. Amy, what have you got to add to it for that? I think I think from, from my perspective as well, one of the things I've really emphasised is in the absence, and this kind of comes back to that very first question around advocacy, in the absence of naturopaths all being involved in research, one of the things I really have been focusing on capturing is the clinician experience and the cl clinician observation of what works, right? Because what we don't have is we don't have a billion dollar pharmaceutical budget for for naturopathic care, because naturopathic care is not but about one treatment. We have multiple treatments that are highly individualized. So what we need to test is naturopathic care with all of its philosophies and the, the range of treatments that have been individualized to the patient. And that type of research doesn't have a pharmaceutical budget attached to it. It has a, pra a professional budget, which our profession isn't rolling in cash and can't afford to just be researching every possible whimsy of treatment and condition and population that comes across everyone's mind. And so one of the things I've been focusing on is by capturing this perspective, we're getting a sense of what is the most common conditions that patient that practitioners are treating, the most common mix of treatments that they might be employing, the most common populations that they're looking after, the settings that they're working in, so that we can pinpoint and make sure that the limited research resources that we will let, will spend on, on clinical research is targeting the things that are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. And that the research outcomes that we evaluate are going to be reflective of grassroots, real life clinical practice, and not just my experience of it, not just your experience of it, but the kind of, in, um, 
the cumulative experience of the profession and, and trying to make sure that that's captured as much as possible. And that's the contribution that I, I really feel, as, as well as all the stuff about communicating to policy and, and those kinds of things as well. There's that aspect of if we're going to do clinical research, we need to make sure we make the most effective steps forward with it. And that needs to be the stuff that represents what's happening in practice already. I have to ask the question though, that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't research by academics run the risk of being relevant for academia and not necessarily being relevant for clinicians in clinic at the, at the grassroots level? Amy, can I start with you? Yes, I think, um, the, the, I think the, the question, I guess, is or what some people don't often realise is that, to be honest, in universities, What's what 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 would work? What works for the academic world would be for us to do no naturopathic research, right? That actually, it it we we get no um, professional advancement. The academic world doesn't really acknowledge um, the the value of what we contribute. Um, if I go to a conference, I could be an invited speaker on a topic, um, a non naturopathic topic, and I could be having a conversation with someone over the lunch table. And then I mention that I'm a naturopath and the lights just go off. And they're completely disinterested and they no longer want to engage. Now that doesn't stop me from you know, um, naming myself as a naturopath. My Twitter tag states me that I'm a naturopath. My, I'm very explicit about it because I make a point of going into these settings and being a naturopath in these environments to desensitize them almost. You know, I'm on the Health Promotion Australia Queensland Committee, the Public Health Association Queensland committee in the women's health special interest group and I'm in these spaces being a naturopath in those spaces and I think it's really important that we do that but by and large me saying that I'm a naturopath me being a naturopath me doing that naturopathic work is actually counterproductive to my own professional career because it's undervalued and dismissed largely by the academic world um, and for that and part of the reason I take the research approach that I do, as I said before, of, of taking the surveying and engaging with practitioners and understanding their perspectives and experiences to make sure that the decisions that we make and the next steps forward aren't about what I think is important. It's about what the profession actually is doing and needs. And I think that's, that's the step around that for me. John, have you, what have you got to add for that, to that? <clears throat> yeah, look, I, I, I think as a, you know, easy thing for clinicians to say because because I think I think you know people like Amy, for example, are probably a little bit too prolific in their public health research that some of their their clinical research, which they are doing and actually are doing more than other people, uh, in terms of the actual trials and the tests and you know the actual clinical treatments, um, is is actually quite substantial. But you know the, the other point is um, you know the profession doesn't exist in a vacuum, and 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 whether you like it or not, um, other people outside the profession assess whether the profession is, is worthy of bringing into the fold or, you know, involving in this particular, you know, uh, area or, 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 or whatever. And, you know, the public health research that Amy's talking about that, that, that her and I have done along with all sorts of colleagues at Arkham, Nickham and um, NCNM and, and, and other universities is incredibly important in that decision-making capacity. And, and I, can, I can vouch because I was there in the room when it happened. Um, you know, the fact that we actually gave them research that showed that naturopaths weren't two-headed creatures that could actually deliver good public health care and actually have positive health outcomes was what changed their mind to actually re, um, re-examine the profession, uh, the private health insurance reviews. So, um, you know, these things actually do have direct impact on that, uh, you know, on that sort of level. I remember, you know, um, Amy's spoken about the AMC, which is a fantastic initiative, but, you know, it, uh, a year and a half ago in Canberra, um, you know, these groups actually met with the Department of Health. The first time the Department of Health had ever met with representatives of the naturopathic profession and were, to be honest, quite blown away by the fact that the naturopaths weren't these crazy people that they see on social media or a current affair. So, um, you know, these things are clinically relevant because they place the profession in the place that the profession should be placed. They might not tell you what, pra- you know, what, what treatment has the most evidence base, but they certainly impact your, your, your practice on the ground. Is, is this indeed part of the problem that you'll get the media saying naturopath for uh, those people who do dangerous practices and indeed affect public health certainly of these patients that have been in the media we all will all know um, Marilyn Bodner there's also the Chinese medicine practitioner involved in the smacking with of the child Um, but they're called under this um, derogatory umbrella of naturopath 
So how do we change that? Do we, do we start indeed with media? Like, <laughs> John? Can, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an easy answer for me. It's an easy answer for me. I think that the, the most important answer is, is registration. Um, and that's, that wouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's ever heard me talk on, on anything related mm. to this to professional issues. I think that what we need is to have some clear definition of, of, of what is required for someone to use that title and have that an enforceable boundary. And part of the research work that I've been doing is to help better understand what the profession is already doing so that the, the, the definition and the boundaries are set as somewhat as reflective of, of practice and, and, the, and the profession. And John? Yeah, look, you know, I, I think registration is a, is a very important issue, but, but the, the, the other issue, of course, is just um, if, if, if people are only seeing those stories on a current affair or, or um, you know, in the newspaper uh, and nothing else, of course, they're going to have a negative view of naturopaths. If they don't have other naturopaths standing in front of them and actually saying, you know, uh, telling positive stories of naturopaths, of course, people are going to have a negative view of naturopaths. And, and to be honest, who can blame them? So, um, you know, I, I, I remember in my... Um, you know, our study of GPs, you know, most patients only tell their GP about their complementary medicine use when something goes wrong. So all the GP is hearing are you know, the negative stories. And um, when the positive stories happen, the patient tells them nothing. So you can't blame people for having a negative perception of, of naturopaths if there are no other naturopathic groups standing in front of them and making a positive case. And, you know, we, we've seen that with the Department of Health. Um, I've seen that with, um, you know, uh, government, non-government, and, and um, you know, with, with MPs and senators, um, because they're filling that vacuum with their own information or their own biases. And, you know, you've got a lot of people who are quite, you know, Friends of Science is a good example. Friends of Science is only powerful because there's no, you know, there's no opposite message being given by the profession itself. So um, Friends of Science are actually abysmally bad at communication. <laughs> they just, um, they just make up for it with just quantity over quanti uh, quality. So. Um, so I think, you know, the advocacy thing that we were talking about before, getting involved in that space and naturopaths actually making the case for naturopaths is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, that, that raises a very interesting question um, or point, and that is I was uh, podcasting with a lecturer at Griffith University, Monique Lewis, about how media can be framed up by certain groups. And indeed, Friends of Science in Medicine have done this. Um, with regards to how naturopathy is viewed uh, or, or presented by media. So the question I guess I to ask both of you is, how can we get more positive media coverage for the naturopathic profession, given that we've got a long way to go to mm. reach registration or indeed acceptance by the you know, orthodox healthcare system? Uh, John, or oh, Amy, no, yeah. you can speak. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so look, you know, I, I think Amy. developing a, pos a positive and proactive media strategy is, is, is really important because, um, oh, sorry, Amy, do you want to go? No, no, it's all you, mate, it's all you. <laughs> look, um, I think when it comes to media, the, the, the two problems that the, the naturopathic community has is it, it, it always talks about itself and it's always reacting to something. There's no proactive media strategy. There's no sandwich technique of good story, good story. So when a bad story comes up, we need to react to a Marilyn Bodnar. Um, you know, you can sort of hide that amongst a number of good stories. Um, and look, you know, nat naturopaths should be speaking out on dietary policy. They should be speaking out on, you know, alcohol policy. They should be speaking out on, you know, exercise policy. You know, the, the, the health minister, you know, last year declared a, um, you, know, uh, you know, the sleep deprivation, a national public health issue of consequence. And where were the naturopaths? They were nowhere. Like, there's yeah. some perfect space for them to be involved in. Mm. Um, if you look at the AMA media strategy, um, you know, they're not speaking out on medicine or on doctors for nine out of 10 of their stories. So that when that one time they have to react or argue against or complain about government policy or a practitioner or unfair um, treatment, uh, you know, they're not seen as being a one trick pony basically. So I think, I think the, the profession probably needs to be a little bit more proactive, sell more of the good stories and, um, you know, define what naturopathy is a little bit better. Um, when John Dwyer came out against that thing, like the media allowed him to define what naturopathy was in his eyes. And it was, you know, I'm, I've written a textbook. I'm, I'm director of a center now. I've been a naturopath for about 20 years. Um, 
and as I said in my radio interviews, you know, I think I trust my definition of naturopathy a little bit more than John Dwyer's. So, um, you know, we need to be able to take that <laughs> um, initiative and actually define who we are rather than let other people define us. Yeah. yeah and okay. I think there's a transition that the profession is currently making and, and just sort of taking almost back in, into the point about the Australian naturopathic council and lobbying mm. that one of the, the, the that issue of, of the diffusion of our resources amongst multiple organizations has limited our ability to engage on these multiple fronts because we've only got actually a small number of people in the profession doing a bulk of this professional advancement work. Most people are in the ground, running their clinics, just trying to get by on a daily basis. And that's, that's what their, their, their primary energy are. And they want to see this work happen, but they're just, it's kind of, why isn't someone doing something about this? Um, and so, you know, as I said, we put in a lot of submissions just um, this last week, the, I helped the NHAA on a submission regards to pregnancy guidelines. They're currently updating the national pregnancy guidelines. And so they put out a call and so we put it in, they had some specific statements in there about probiotics and herbal medicines. And so we, I said, we, we have to step in, we have to submit to these things. We have to be a part of these conversations, just like the chronic disease management plan. There was nothing in there about complementary medicine, but naturopathy is not a complementary medicine. It's a health profession. And if we're pro providing health in the community, we're part, part of the health system, we have to be a part of that. So we've been incrementally making this way on, at a policy and lobbying level, but we haven't been able to transition that energy into the media, general mass media communications. And I think that is the next step. And it's not for want of, of for lack of wanting to do that within the people doing the work. It's just a complete lack of human resources, that just the time that's required to do all of these things, to upskill and to undertake that work. Um, we need more, more people with those skills prepared to put the energy in. I mean, most of the work that I do for the profession is volunteer. I don't, you know, it's not a paid work. Even though a lot of the research I do for the World Naturopathic Federation, um, and it's only one project I've ever done for them that I've received any funding for. I actually didn't get that funding. It went for publication costs and those sorts of things. So most of this work is volunteer. It's not a paid paid gig. And um, and we just need more people stepping forward who've got the skills and the, and the capacity to, to put some time and energy in to address media communications and lobbying and all of these things. You made a point just then about uh, so many associations, though. Does, does it really require the dissolution of all of those associations for one? Because can't people still have their, you know, their different memberships, if you like, in the various associations, but we need one lobby group. Is that what you're saying? Is that what we need? Well, yes, I think, I mean, one of the things that the World Naturopathic Federation has been really important for is being able to distill down the organisations that actually represent naturopaths and naturopathy. And um, there's, they've got a very clear definition, which John will be able to tell you the exact wording of, but that's informed by the World Health Organization requirements of what a professional association that represents naturopathy, what its characteristics have, have to be. And there's actually, as hard, there's, um, we've got two um, members of the WNF in Australia, two member organizations that are association members and they're, they're, they are the ones. And so that's actually helping to distill that energy down because other organizations that don't have a majority membership of naturopaths and whose focus is not primarily on nat advancing naturopathy, actually aren't recognised by the World Naturopathic Federation or the World Health Organisation as appropriate for advocating for naturopathy. And so that just kind of clears things down. Now, that doesn't stop people from being members of whatever they want to be a member of. They can be a member of integrative medicine associations and allied health organisations. And me, I'm a member of the Australian Health Promotion Association, the Public Health Association, um, you know, the Lifestyle Society of Medicine, um, Hearthstone Medicine Society, all of those things, that these are all organisations that are completely legitimate and naturopaths have every right to be a part of them. But don't expect those organisations to take the responsibility for advocating for naturopathy because they're not naturopathic organisations. And I think that's the difference. Right. John? Yeah, look, I think a lot of people, you know, there's, there's a lot of probably misplaced loyalty is probably a, a, a harsh term, but it, you know, it, it's certainly true in many, in, in many cases. You know, there's a lot of areas where multiple professions can and should work together. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what's happened primarily in Australia is you've had, I guess, traditional medicine or natural medicine or, or complementary medicine societies trying to represent this disparate group of, of practices with very, very different needs um, in an all or nothing kind of approach. And, and you know, I, I've certainly seen it, um, you know, where, uh, you know, some associations have argued against registration unless it includes everyone. 
never going to work. <laughs> you know, um, there are, you know, it is very important for professions to be able to have their own leadership as well as be able to work in conjunction with other areas. So allied health is an example I use, um, you know, physiotherapy or dietitians or, or whatever have their own individual groups and they work with the allied health association or the allied health council when they have a, a, a set of unified needs. The problem in Australia is we, we've got the allied health associations sort of dictating everything and trying to be everything to everyone. And ultimately, they're nothing to, to, to no one. So I, I you know, I, I don't think that we should start waging war against each other. But I do think that each individual profession should be considering what its needs are unique to other other professional needs and actually advocating on that um, themselves. So do you, um, you, do you think we require registration, though, to to set up um, such things as, let's say, a minimum wage for naturopaths? Because dietitians have a minimum wage and they're outside of APRA. So can, can it be facilitated, facilitated outside of a, a national registration system for naturopaths that there is career um, solidarity? No? Um, career um, advancement? Well, there's only one reason that the dietitians can do that, and that's because there's one association which the government recognises and actually um, make, you know, legitimises essentially through um, accreditation requirements for Medicare rebates. So um, the issue in a profession like naturopaths is um, you have multiple associations with multiple viewpoints and the government can't sign Multiple. a document with one organization and until it can sign a document with every organization, it won't sign any document. So right. this, you know, this, this has really been the issue, I guess, for the last 40 years of naturopathic development. It's been the number one reason why, why the naturopaths just haven't got as far as other professions have in, in, in pretty much anywhere. Um, even though naturopaths are punching above their weight in terms of seeing the patient, uh, seeing the public, punching above their weight in terms of actually doing research and all the things that we're supposed to be doing as a professions, uh, as a profession, uh, naturopaths are doing everything right except for their professional organisation, <laughs> to be honest. So, and you know, if they can get that sorted, they're they're, they're going to be unstoppable. Amy, what he said. <laughs> Great answer. <answer-up. laughs> so let, let's talk about some of the criticism that you guys have received. Now, John, you've mentioned John Dwyer two, twice, three times. Um, um, so let's talk about some of the criticism that you yeah. both have received for your work or about your work. Um, what what's happened and how do you think we can move forward? How can we collaborate better to have a more unified profession moving forward into the future? What needs to change? Um, Amy, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, I think this, just acknowledging that, that, I guess, for a start, the criticism is not just a Friends of Science and Medicine criticism. Um, you know, a large bulk of the criticisms that, um, that I deal with are actually coming from within the profession about people... Um, questioning what what I'm doing, whether or not they can, you know, trust my motives, whether they, you know, those sorts of, um, uh, whether or not I, I truly understand naturopathic practice, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I think it's interesting for me because when I was first starting out doing my PhD, I was doing a lot of work in maternity care research. I was a lot, I was around the midwifery profession, which similar to, to naturopathy actually started out with trainee-based education and transitioned in, in hospitals and what have you and transitioned into very professionalization of universities. Um, they're kind of differentiating themselves as, as partially primary care, but also working alongside doctors. And, and, you know, there's all of these very similar factors. But what I really observed was that the work that was being done by the research community was seen as valuable um, by, the, by the profession at, in general. Um, and I think that I, one of the things that I've realized is that a lot of the work that we do, we're too busy doing the work to tell people about the work. And it feels a bit awkward too. Like I've just recently shared a few articles on some of the social media platforms because I actually realized that some of the work that's being produced is really relevant to practice, but it feels really odd sharing that stuff within the um, Facebook community. I'll share them on Twitter, no problem because I feel like I'm just making it available, but it's very, it feels a bit difficult. So that's something I think I personally and, and other researchers, we need to take responsibility for finding ways to getting information about the work we're doing out to the profession. Um, but it, I think the main thing we can do to respond to critics outside of the profession is what we've been doing so well up until this point 
is making sure that the work that we do is just so rigorous and has such a, uh, as for flawless research design and principles and, 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 and the practice of the work that we do, that they, they can't dismiss it. They would love to, and I can, you can tell sometimes how much some of these critics would love to be able to dismiss the work that we're doing, but they can't because that the, um, the work is sound. We're doing good research and they can't push it to the side. So that in terms of actually making sure that, that that is addressed, but I think the, the bigger issue of consolidating the profession is for us as a profession to realise that there is going to be diverse views on a lot of topics and that we don't need to agree on everything, that we, we can have varying perspectives on different issues and that that's okay. Um, and I think that, that, that there is also going to be a common element that, that we all do agree on. And so long as that co common element is, is something that we agree on, then we can proceed as a profession and move forward. Do and for me, that, that agreement is that naturopathy is of value and it, ha and it, it has something that it can really contribute to the society if, if we continue to do what we do very well. John, what have you got to add there? Don't say what yeah, she said. I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, what, 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 what Amy said, and, you know, it, it, it's right, you know, there's, there's always been that joke that if you put, you know, two naturopaths in a room, you get three different opinions. And I think that, um, you know, we, we all laugh at that as students and we all laugh at that at conferences, but it certainly doesn't play out that way on Facebook um, or, you know, other, 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 other forums. So, you know, my, my personal viewpoint is the only person that's not a real naturopath is, is a naturopath that tells another naturopath they're not a real naturopath. Um, you know, there is supposed to be diversity of view, but the profession from day dot has had, you know, a number of different approaches to do it. And to be honest, I think that's actually its strength, not its weakness. The fact that we can have, you know, people who are green allopaths and people who are nature cure um, purists actually applying the principles and philosophies and getting, you know, patient results in, in different ways, but still under that unified theoretical and philosophical framework is an incredible um, so, you know, incredible boon and, 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 and strength of the profession. It's not a weakness. And we need to acknowledge that it's okay to have those differences. We don't all need to be the same. Like most of us came to the naturopathic profession because we didn't want to be the same. And I think the fact that people are now trying to, once we're in here, trying to put us into the same box, just, just is, isn't, it, it doesn't compute with, 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 with the naturopathic philosophy or principles. Yeah, this is the thing that I have trouble with. Um, it's okay to disagree, but there's, uh, the problem is that I feel dissent within naturopathy, whereas if you take other professions, let's say pharmacy, you've got the industry lobbying group, the guild, and you've got the professional guidelines or standards group, and that's the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. So there's basically these two major lobbying groups, but they're all lobbying for the one cause. You can have, you know, the Rural Doctors Association, you can have whatever small association, a doctor, a doctor, and I'm going to say club, I'm not meaning to be derogatory, <laughs> but, um, you know, whatever association they want to, uh, to be a part of, but they have the RACGP as the College of, um, Royal Australian College of General Practitioners that looks after guidelines and the Australian Medical Association, which looks after, after lobbying, so, or the, you know, if you like the industry part of medicine. So it, it just seems that we haven't yet gotten to where these professions mm. have made it. And it, I, I get the feeling that people want to, or feel that they're gonna have to lose a major part of being a clinician if they want this recognition to stand up. Do you, do you feel that this is what has to happen? Do you think we're gonna have to lose a major part of what it is to be a naturopath, to be recognised by government or on a national level? Amy, I'll start with you again. I, I think, I, I, I guess I'll, I will acknowledge that there is a risk of that. And that risk is, is actually founded on us not being part of it and leading it ourselves. People who actually understand naturopathy and what it means to be a naturopath and what naturopathic principles and philosophies look like, feel like, and are practiced like on the ground. If we don't have that, that the, the naturopaths progressing this, then people from outside will try to do it and they'll do 
as I said, they'll, they'll be doing the sort of stuff that John's talked about. And I mean, we've got World Health Organization guidelines at the moment that define naturopathic philosophy or principles that not a single naturopath was involved in drafting. Not a single naturopath, because there wasn't people active at that level that could actually be involved. So um, now that's, that's probably an overstatement. I think there was some involved in the periphery, but the final decision making around that, they didn't involve any naturopaths in that process. So I think one of the, the things that we have to really realize that for us to make sure that the outcome is the outcome we need for our profession, it means we have to be making that outcome for ourselves. We have to be leading it. We have to be actively a part of it. Um, and rather than sitting back and wondering why it's happening to us, we make it happen for ourselves in the way that it, we, it needs to happen. And that's the way we get what we need out of it. John, can you continue, please? Yeah, uh, well, first I just want to assuage people's fears that that, that was the, you know, that WHO document was the reason for the funding of the um, World Naturopathic Federation. And <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that, that actually has changed a lot there. You know, yeah. that document hasn't been changed, but it's in the process of. I, and it's because the naturopaths are actually showing leadership in doing that. You know, people want naturopaths to be determining naturopathic leadership in these spaces. But if there is no one, they're going to put whoever's standing next to them in charge instead. So, yep. um, look, you know, I, I, I agree with Amy. Look, the, the only danger is the naturopaths themselves not being involved in this, in, you know, in, in this space. And, um, you know, I think, you, you know, you mentioned the AMA, you know, RACGP, you know, Pharmacy Guild. Um, these aren't unified professions. Like, you know, they, they oh. walk out the door, they sort of, you know, dress in their, you know, they, they, they dust off their tie and, you know, put their tie or, or straighten their skirts or, or, or whatever up. But, you know, if you, if you open up the door and see, look into the meeting room, you know, there's chairs flung everywhere, there's broken windows, there's all sorts of, you know, disunity that's gone on there. But, you know, they, they recognise what they can't move forward on and they recognise what they can move forward on and that's what they do to push their profession forward. And I right. Think the, the, the problem with the naturopathic profession generally and registration and degree education are two perfect examples of this. Um, you know, they can't look past one issue. So if you're against registration and I'm for it, all of a sudden I can't work with you on anything. Or, you know, th th there's this all or nothing approach which is really detrimental to the profession and we need to, you know, you know clinically, it, it, it's, 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 it's amazing when you think about it, that clinically we live in the world of grey professionally we can't do anything but black and white so you know we need to we need to i guess you know treat our profession more like we treat our patients wise words and and, and very responsible because i totally adhere to that we need to treat ourselves as much as we treat our patients and, and with that not just humility but respect um so thank you both john wardle and amy Steele, for joining us on fx medicine today this is obviously a huge topic i would welcome you back to thrash out further issues at a later date if you'd love to be a part of and join us again on fx medicine thanks yeah. happy to yeah would, would love to thanks thanks for having us on today this is fx medicine i'm andrew whitfield cook if you're loving our fx medicine podcasts please don't forget to share us with your colleagues family and friends